good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on the use of SBA joint ventures and mentor protege programs. My name is Susan Moser. I am a partner and leader of Cherry Beckert's government contract industry practice. I've been doing this a long time. I've got about 30 years of experience and 20 years at Cherry Beckert. Uh, we're an accounting and consulting firm. And I'm delighted to have John Jensen joining me today. John is the co-leader of Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman's uh, government contracts and disputes practice. John also has 30 years of experience representing and counseling clients um, across all areas of federal contracts. So uh, between the two of us, we will be leading the discussion today. Uh, we decided we wanted to talk about this subject because joint ventures, uh, which have been around for a long time, but are increasingly popular and increasingly an area where there's a lot of confusion and uh, not uh, a lot of people ask us lots of questions. So we decided that this would be a good, um, good discussion to have today. So I wanna run through the agenda. Uh, we do have a lot that we're gonna pack in in one hour. So a little housekeeping first. Um, so we will, you will receive a copy of the slides um, in an email link after today's presentation. So you will get that. Um, the presentations will also be available um, both on the Cherry Becker website and on the Pillsbury website after the presentation for download. Um, we do wanna encourage questions. Um, that said, we have a lot of content here to cover in an hour, and we could probably make this two hours, but we're gonna try to keep it to an hour. So if you do have questions, we do encourage you to submit those. You can use the, the questions feature. Um, if we don't answer the questions at the end of the presentation, which um, again, it may be difficult for us to do, we will follow up with you directly and uh, try and answer the questions. Uh, so with that, let me run through the agenda. So uh, today's agenda, we're gonna first start out just giving some, some basic information on, on joint ventures, what are joint ventures. We're gonna talk specifically about joint ventures under the SBA programs, uh, the mentor protege program, uh, including some recent changes to the SBA programs. We're gonna cover important elements for you to include in joint venture agreements. We're gonna talk about some pricing techniques. We get lots of questions on, on uh, how joint venture parties are putting together proposals. We're also gonna cover a little bit about the financial reporting for joint ventures. Uh, again, another area that we get lots of questions about. And finally, we'll wrap it up with how to make joint ventures a win-win for both parties. Uh, so with that, um, just a quick overview on joint ventures. So joint ventures um, have been around a long time and are, are, and are used in many different industries, certainly not just government contracting. Um, joint ventures are covered in the FAR um, and under FAR Part 9 that deals with contractor qualifications. Uh, 9.6011 uh, is the definition of a prime contractor teaming arrangement uh, where two or more companies form a partnership or joint venture to act as a potential prime contractor. That's different than uh, in 9.6012 uh, describes the traditional prime contractor that agrees to have one or more subcontractors. And one thing that's important to note, um, in various uh, RFPs that companies uh, pursue, uh, different RFPs de treat past performance differently sometimes for joint ventures in terms of what they allow for corporate experience, um, which is sometimes different than in a traditional prime sub relationship. So um, every RFP is, is different, but that is an important, um, an important component. Um, so a joint venture is simply when two or more parties agree to pool their resources um, for the purpose of a specific task. Um, it's shared responsibility, shared risks, shared shared reward. Um, so John's gonna talk a little bit about the joint ventures and then we'll get into specifically under the SBA programs. Thank you, Susan. Uh, and greetings to all of our attendees today. Um, as Susan was saying, uh, this is a complicated but exciting area of the government contracts market. 
um, and I've worked with the Small Business Administration Joint Venture Program for 20 years. So um, I've seen a lot and uh, going to try to convey some of our lessons learned today. But um, speaking of joint ventures, generally first, following up on Susan's last slide, uh, joint ventures can generally be either populated or unpopulated. Populated meaning that the joint venture that you've created has its own employees. Unpopulated meaning that it effectively has to contract with its partners or other third parties for the labor under the, con under the joint venture. And joint ventures generally can take different legal forms. Typically, we see them as limited liability companies, but they can take different legal forms as well, and we see that occasionally too. The focus today, as indicated, is on joint ventures between mentors and protégés for set-aside contracts under the purview of the SBA. And the SBA has extensive rules on its joint ventures. <clears throat> The crux of the, of the regulations really centers on the idea of affiliation. Um, it's not that the SBA uh, is not willing to recognize entities as joint ventures that don't meet all of their rules, but the problem will be that where two businesses, typically a large and a small business, are joint venturing, the SBA will find those, those to be affiliated and therefore not eligible for any small business set aside awards. So the purpose of the joint venture regulation and the mentor protege rule is to allow the large business and the joint venture to form joint ventures with, um, without risk of affiliation. And that's really the goal of following all these regulations is to qualify as a small business. And finally, um, general point to keep in mind that one another advantage of using the joint venture approach towards small businesses is that the SBA regulations specifically say that a procuring activity must consider the work done individually by each partner to the joint venture when assessing past performance. So the SBA has had the Mentor Protege program around for uh, for quite a long time. The actual the the SBA Mentor Protege program was created for 8A companies specifically in 1998, and it was really developed to enhance the capabilities of 8A firms and and improve their ability to compete. So it took another uh, 18 years for uh, the SBA to make a change in 2016. They came out with the All Small Mentor Protege program, which was really designed based on the 8A program. Uh, it was to extend the, the benefits to every small business. It was similar, but it was not the same. So it, the, the, some of the requirements were different. Um, but the all small allows a, a protege company, a small company to coordinate with a mentor, which really could be a large or small company um, other than an affiliate to submit an application uh, for the mentor protege program. So that's, uh, that's what we've had to date, and, and John is going to cover later on some, some current changes with that. So what is a mentor-protege agreement? Well, in order to form one of these joint ventures that the SBA will recognize as a waiver of affiliation between a large business and a small business, you have to start first with a mentor-protege agreement that's approved by the SBA. It's a fairly simple legal document. It describes the relationship between the mentor and the protege. And again, once it gets affirmatively approved by the SBA, a process that doesn't take too long, the two companies are then free to go ahead and form a joint venture to pursue a set aside contract. And once the mentor protege agreement is approved, it will typically last three years and may be extended for an additional three years. So total, Think about a six-year relationship with your mentor or with your protege during which you may pursue a variety of government assistance, including eligibility as a small business in the form of your joint ventures that you form. Next slide, please. So the goals of the of the program are pretty straightforward to, to help you know, develop strong uh, protege firms through mentor relationships to enhance, you know, protege firms' ability to compete, 
Um, and I think we've all seen situations where men, men are, excuse me, men or protege programs have not worked that well. Um, we all have companies that we know that have been in these uh, arrangements and then really nothing has happened. Um, but it's really should be designed to to be a win-win for for both companies, not just the uh, not just the protege company. The SBA is not going to approve a mentor protege unless it determines that a mentor protege assistance will really promote the developmental gains of the protege. So the things we're going to talk about today are hopefully to to make help companies become successful under these arrangements. So briefly. Who could be a mentor and who can be a protege? Well, the door is pretty open when it comes to mentors. It's any concern that demonstrates a commitment and the ability to assist small business concerns. A mentor can either be a small business or a large business. It has to be capable of assisting the protege firm. It has to, be, it has to possess good character. It can't be suspended or debarred. And it has to be able to impart practical experience um, or through knowledge of general business operations and government contracting. Very general, pretty loose standards. Very few companies will get disqualified as a mentor based on these criteria. But one of the important rules is that mentors may have one protege at a time unless there would be no adverse impact on an existing protege. <clears throat> Mentors can have a total of three, again, assuming that the protégés are not going to be uh, in competitors of one another. Typically, you look to the NAICS code. If your protégés are in different NAICS codes, probably they're not going to be deemed to be competitors. Next slide, please. As far as protégé eligibility goes, the general rule is that, of course, you have to be small for the size standard in question. And the um, the, the rule is that you either have to be small for your so-called primary NAICS code, which is the industry code in which you do the majority or, or, or the largest portion of your work, or small and secondary NAICS code in which you have experience or that reflects a logical business progression for the firm. In addition, the general rule is that you may have only one mentor at a time but the SBA can approve a second mentor under certain circumstances. The second relationship can't compete with the first. Essentially, you can't have two mentors providing the same assistance. And then in addition, the second relationship has to either pertain to an unrelated NAICS code from the industry in which you're getting the assistance under the first mentor, um, or the protege has to be seeking to acquire experience that for some other reason your first met mentor doesn't possess and can provide to you as, as a protege. And if you can meet those criteria, you can actually have two mentors. The mentor-protege agreement, as mentioned, it's relatively short, it's in writing, it gets approved by the SBA, but it, you can't, it can't be done in a, in a slap shot manner. It has to lay out in a fair degree of detail the protege's needs first. And um, the question is, well, how much detail do you need to get into? And, you know, how do you determine what the protégés needs are? Um, I can tell you that when the protégés are 8A companies, a good guide for their needs are the, um, the uh, developmental needs statements that the 8A company has submitted to the SBA. And very often you use those, and sometimes you have to use those as the basis, as the baseline for determining what the needs are that the protege will be expected to fulfill. And then along with the statement of the needs, there will be a statement of what the activities will be that the protege, the mentor will provide. And there has to be a timeline. And it often has to be a fairly specific timeline in terms of weeks or months or days during which the assistance will be provided. And if you can get that level of detail, you should probably be able to move through the SBA approval process pretty quickly. And it also has to specify that the assistance will be provided for at least a year. So in terms of what are the benefits, um, so there are some stated uh, 
benefits. Um, but, you know, really the whole idea is for the protege we've talked about is to strengthen their competitive um, position to help them develop technically um, without the worry of the affiliation role, uh, roles. But it also can be an opportunity to enhance the value of a company. Um, you know, if, if you, companies that are participants in joint ventures, there's obviously value there. Um, for, from the mentor standpoint, obviously, um, you know, one of the key things is that they have access to small business contracting opportunities that they wouldn't uh, otherwise. Um, they can get extra credit on subcontracting plans. And um, again, there's a number of opportunities for them to increase their supply chain to help um, develop, you know, future partners for other purposes. And, and the government obviously is trying to meet its set-aside goals. So it, the government views these op as opportunities to help them meet their, uh, their goals, and obviously in addition to increasing the, the supply base. Um, so as we talked about, you know, their stated goals, but, but re what really happens? Um, do, do both companies, you know, recognize and realize the benefits? And, and I, there's lots of good cases where that has happened, and, but that's not always the case. Um, under the mentor protege, uh, there are, and we'll go get into a little bit more detail. There are uh, a number of reports and things that have to be prepared. Um, the the protege is is really responsible for that. Um, the mentors, as we mentioned, have to uh, and the um, the SBA can terminate agreements for non-compliance hasn't provided proper assistance. So the SBA's basic rules on joint ventures are first that the joint venture has to be registered in the system for award management or SAM, just like any government contractor has to be recognized, has to be registered in SAM. The SBA is also pretty liberal about how the joint venture can be formed. It may be a formal or informal partnership, um, or it may exist as a separate limited liability company or some other sort of legal entity. However, the SBA does say that their joint ventures must not be populated. So in order to get the affili affiliation waiver and participate in this program, your joint venture is not gonna be structured as one with its own employees, generally speaking. Also, joint ventures are intended to be of a limited duration. The SBA doesn't want them existing in perpetuity. We'll talk a little bit about the rules for the limited duration uh, toward the end of the presentation. And um, last, uh, the SBA does allow uh, additional joint ventures to be created between mentors and protege over time. So this slide, I think, is really sort of the kernel of the sort of the most important things that I have to say about the Mentor Protege Joint Venture Program. The first point is that there is difference between regulatory requirements and contractual protection. The SBA has very specific rules on what your joint venture must say in order for it to meet the SBA's requirements. In addition, you will want to protect yourself vis-a-vis -vis the other contractor whether it's the mentor or the protege, just like you will in any contract. You want to make sure that your interests are protected. So we'll have two sets of, of provisions in your joint venture agreement, those that are required by the SBA and those that are required basically to protect your corporate interests, and we're going to have to weave those together. Second, it's important to remember that your compliance with the SBA's requirements for your joint venture agreement will be assessed at the time that you submit your proposal for the contract meaning that you have to get it right up front. Amendments to joint venture agreements are permissible, but you really don't want to be trying to mend a joint venture agreement after you submitted your proposal, because again, compliance is assessed at the time that you submit your proposal, just like size is assessed at the time that you submit your proposal. Third, really the big issue in every one of these joint venture negotiations is how much control the mentor, the large business will have in running the joint venture. This is a very tricky area. There are not a lot of bright lines on what is and is not permissible. 
when we are representing the mentors, the mentors would always like to have, in theory, more control rather than less, but we never want the mentors to step over the line because that will invalidate the eligibility of the joint venture for the contract. And then last, you should remind, bear in mind that these joint ventures for US government contracts can be around for a long time. Government contracts can last a long time and particularly cost reimbursement government contracts can last a really long time. And the question is, who's gonna be doing what and who's gonna have the power to do what during those years until the joint, joint venture eventually winds itself down. Next slide. So I mentioned that the SDA has a lot of specific rules and I'll just run through these um, to give you an idea. The SDA requires that the joint venture agreement state the purpose of the joint venture, which would typically be to pursue one or more uh, identified uh, procurements. Um, second, the SBA requires that the protege be the quote unquote managing venturer managing the joint venture and that it have an employee who has always been called the so-called project manager who has responsibility for managing the joint venture. Oftentimes the protege doesn't have that individual on their payroll at the time that they put their joint venture together. So the SBA allows for the protege to have a letter of intent with an individual to join them as an employee and as the project manager, subject to the limitation that that individual cannot then be a mentor employee who's basically gonna switch sides and become the protege project manager. The protege has to own at least 51% of the joint venture. The uh, profits of the joint venture have to be distributed in a manner that's quote unquote commensurate with the work performed not 51-49, not necessarily in, connect, in the same ratio as ownership, but rather commensurate with the work performed. And then there is a rule that the joint venture have its own bank account into which all contract proceeds must be made, all withdrawals must, must come, and it requires the signatures of both parties. Next slide, please. This next item on itemization is the regulatory requirement where most companies slip and fall. Um, it's hard to put this into a joint venture agreement when you're working hard to get your bid together. But the SBA does require that your joint venture agreement itemize all major equipment, facilities, and other resources to be furnished by each party with a detailed schedule of costs or value of each. We are practical. <clears throat> Many times companies won't do this, simply because it's extremely challenging and people aren't sure what the right answer is. Unless you're bidding on an IDIQ contract, this is something that you have to actually do. The exception, as noted, is where you have an IDIQ procurement where you don't have a defined statement of work. And in that circumstance, instead of providing a detailed schedule of the cost of the items, you're allowed to provide quote unquote, general description of the items. Next, you likewise have to identify the responsibilities of each party in the negotiation of the contract, the source of the labor and contract performance. Again, can be challenging to do. Again, there's an exception for IDIQ contracts that you're bidding on. And there's always needs, always needs to be a provision that obligates each party to complete the contract performance if the other party withdraws from the JV. Hey, John, just one comment on the responsibilities of each party. So one of the things that we don't, don't see companies do as often as, as maybe they should, which particularly protege companies, to ask the mentor to provide you know, help or resources in particular areas. So as an example, uh, We've got some mentor protege JVs where the the mentor company provides certain financial assistance, provides more help in certain areas. Um, but a lot of companies, you know, the joint venture parties don't really have those discussions up front, as you said. And and so, you know, my advice is always, particularly for the the protege companies, is you know ask for help, ask for things to, uh, to, to get as part of your joint venture agreement. 
that's good advice. Um, uh, and, and related to that, it's also always my advice that while your mentor protege agreement needs to be, as I noted, fairly specific in terms of the assistance that will be provided, it's also good that it be fairly general in terms of the potential scope of the assistance, because any assistance that is provided that's outside the four corners of the mentor protege agreement might contribute to a finding of affiliation. So yes, I think the parties should be careful and thoughtful when they put their mentor protege agreements to make sure that they're broad enough to cover all the sorts of assistance that the, the protege may need. So the last of the SBA requirements, we're getting towards the end, um, are what you see on the screen here. That the joint venture agreement needs to address the location of accounting and administrative records, which typically needs to be with the protege company. The SBA requires that the final records be retained by the protege company. The joint venture agreement has to allow for the inspection of the records of the joint venture by the SBA. It has to provide for the submission of quarterly financial statements within 45 days at the end of the quarter to both the SBA and to the contracting officer. And similarly, the submission of project and profit and loss statements 90 days after the contract ends to both the SBA and the contracting officer. And then last, the submission of performance of work reports, which need to be made annually, and then again at the completion of the contract. And what are performance of work reports? Well, they're reports that are addressing the items on this last slide, which is first the so-called 50% rule, um, which is the limitation on subcontracting that applies to any type of small business set aside contract, which we now know is that the small business, in this case, the joint venture, may not pay more than 50% of the amount paid by the government to it, to firms that are not so-called similarly situated. Um, but in addition to that general rule, which you're probably familiar with, there is the SBA's 40% rule, which is that the protege must perform at least 40% of the work. And in determining that, in determining the amount of work that the mentor participating in the joint venture um, does, um, all work that's done by the mentor and any of its affiliates at any subcontracting tier in the joint venture are going to be counted as the work of the mentor. So that's a, another little rule the SBA has. And then also there's a requirement that the protege's work must be more than administrative or ministerial. Um, that's almost always the case, but it should be in the joint venture agreement. Next slide. And then um, beyond the SBA regulatory requirements, uh, you know, look what we have here. These are pretty important subjects, right? Um, the SBA will not, will, doesn't regulate um, these sorts of provisions in the joint venture agreement. Um, there, the SBA really leaves it to the two companies to negotiate these provisions. And as you can see, they're pretty important type aspects of your relationship with your counterparty. Um, but bear in mind, that these provisions very much can bear on the issue of control and whether or not the protege actually keeps control of the joint venture agreement. So there's always a tension in drafting these to make sure that we don't overstep the bounds and put the joint venture in a situation where it won't enjoy the benefit of the affiliation waiver. Okay. So we've formed our mentor protege agreement. We've entered into a joint venture. We've got the document, we've got the joint venture formed, and now we want to talk about going after a contract because that's obviously the whole purpose. So, you know, it's it's pretty typical that companies uh, form the joint venture. Um, as as John mentioned, it has to be a registered in SAM. Typically, um, as he mentioned, it is most common we see our LLCs. Usually there is a separate tax return. It's usually ta uh, the, uh, taxed as a, or treated as a partnership for tax purposes. Um, so it may be, you know, a joint venture could be in operation for a year or so before, or, uh, you know, hopefully less than that before uh, you start bidding on contracts. But, um, 
But once you start bidding on a contract, um, it's really important that the joint venture parties think through how they're going to handle this. So some joint ventures, if you're pursuing a contract, and, and obviously some joint ventures are pursuing IDIQ contracts uh, where there may be other teaming partners, other members, um, subcontractors, or you may have contracts, whether it's an IDIQ or, or a single award, uh, that are just going to be performed by the two joint venture members. So it's important to think through and plan ahead how you're going to price your joint venture. Um, obviously, the contract type makes a difference in terms of um, how that, the work share. So of course, you have to um, meet the requirements that John laid out in terms of the uh, protege company performing at least 40% of the work. Um, but the parties should really think through and how are they going to um, how are they going to to build the contract proposal? Who's going to uh, perform what portion of the work? And how is the cost proposal going to be put together? So the proposal is obviously going to be submitted by the by the joint venture. Um, typically, typical scenario, the work is performed by the two uh, joint venture members as subcontractors. Um, but all kinds of questions come up in terms of the, the pricing. Do both of the subcontractors who are joint venture partners include all of the profit just in their subcontracts? Um, the challenge with that is if all of the profit is built into the subcontracts, um, then you're never going to potentially show a profit in the joint venture. So there's, there's different techniques. Um, it really depends on the contract type, the type of work, the work share to think about in terms of how you're going to price that. Some, some joint ventures, each subcontract party, joint venture party, puts some profit on its subcontract costs that it'll be performing, but they might leave some of the profit that will be um, at the, at the uh, joint venture level. Um, joint ventures, while they're unpopulated, uh, they do have some expenses besides just the contract expenses. There's typically going to be, you know, accounting, filing fees. There might be some some legal fees, insurance, and things like that. So there are some indirect costs that the joint venture is going to incur. And and sometimes, uh, you know, it may make sense where the joint venture has a some type of an indirect cost rate that it's applying. So there's lots of different ways to um, to to think about the pricing. Um, for, for what's going to provide the most, um, you know, the most competitive situation, but obviously be fair to, to both parties. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the accounting and reporting because we get lots of questions. Um, so a couple slides back, we uh, talked about um, the financial reporting requirements that the SBA, that the SBA uh, requires. And as John said, um, the protege company is typically responsible for that. That doesn't mean that they have to do that themselves. They can outsource that. They can have a third party do that, but they should have a separate set of books. So they should not be doing this in your, in your, the protege company's uh, accounting records. It should be a separate, um, a separate set of books. Um, again, it can be pretty simple from an accounting standpoint. Um, you're recording the, you have to have your own bank account, as John mentioned. You're going to have a um, revenue that you're going to bill uh, under the joint venture, and typically your expenses are going to be pretty uh, pretty limited to uh, the subcontract costs, um, other teaming partners, other ODCs on the contract um, if they don't come through the uh, one of the subcontractors, and then the the incidental costs. Um, so I'm not going to get too much into the weeds on, on some of these accounting topics, but we do get lots of questions about how joint ventures are supposed to be reported. And so um, there's an accounting standard that, um, that dictates how investments are handled. And so basically a joint venture typically is handled under the equity method. And the reason that even if a, a one of the joint venture members has a, has a you know, owns more than a 50% interest, because the whole nature of joint ventures is designed so that both parties um, have um, have influence control, and so um, so typically they are accounted for as the equity under the equity method in your financial statement. So 
So what does that so what does that mean? So really, what it means is that um, a joint venture is structured so that both parties really have equal or near equal um, control. And so because of that, you're not going to consolidate, even if you had a 51% interest, you're not going to consolidate all of the joint venture activity in your financial statements. You're going to record that separately. So basically what happens, so if you are a joint venture, um, if you own a portion of a joint venture, you're going to have an asset on your books, on your balance sheet for your initial investment, and say that may be $5,000. Um, and then you are going to report just the net activity of the joint venture at your, percent, your percentage of that. So it's kind of a basic example. You initially contribute $5,000 to the joint venture the first year of the joint venture. Just say you successfully win a contract, you have a net profit of 100,000, that's your share. Um, you distribute, the joint venture distributes 50,000, and so then your net investment on your balance sheet is 55, is 55,000. Um, when you do sell a joint venture, um, that does happen, it can happen, it's treated, um, it's treated as, as a sale. Um, joint ventures should be disclosed on both uh, members' uh, financial statements. Um, there are some required disclosures. You should um, uh, describe the nature of the joint venture, your ownership in the joint venture. Um, you should also disclose uh, some condensed financial information for the joint venture, um, including uh, in, your, in the footnotes on the financial statement. So the joint venture, typically the notes would show the total assets of the joint venture, the total liabilities, the members' equity, the net income, and then your particular share of that. Um, and then you summarize your investment activity for the year. Um, you also should disclose in your financial statements related party transactions. So um, you will report in your financial statements if you, um, the joint venture, just as an example, has a million dollar contract, you as a joint venture member uh, performed subcontract work for, um, for 600,000. Uh, that's reported as revenue on your financial statements, you would disclose that in your financial um, statements as a related party um, transaction. So just wanted to go into a little bit of detail on that because we always get lots of questions and there's a lot of confusion about um, accounting for, for joint ventures. I want to turn it over to John to talk a little bit about the SBA new rule changes. So, so maybe a lot of what I said is something you're familiar with because this program's been around for, for 20 years plus, but, but it's important to know that the SBA has just made some changes to the Mentor-Protege program and to the joint venture regulations. Um, they, were, they were published um, a few weeks ago on October 16th, effective November 16th. So these are the regulations that we now need to be, be working with. And uh, these, are, these are good changes. These are improvements. Um, I, I hand it to the SBA lawyers. Uh, they made some good fixes. Um, first, the thing you probably heard something about is the consolidation of the two mentor-protege programs. As Susan had mentioned, 20-plus um, you know, years ago, the SBA created the 8A mentor-protege program. And then um, in, in implementing um, a congressional directive, the SBA uh, developed its so-called all small mentor-protege program, which really opened the doors to all, all small businesses. Uh, now, after a couple of years of running two parallel mentor-protege programs, the SBA is consolidating them into a single program. Uh, if you happen to have an 8A mentor-protege agreement, it's now going to fall under the auspices of the all small mentor-protege program and uh, 8A uh, companies who want to pursue the mentor-protege program will um, simply uh, put their application into the all-small program, just like other small businesses. So that's probably a, a welcome simplification to the world. Next slide, please. There are also some changes um, in terms of sort of fine-tuning the, the mentor-protege program. Um, first, uh, the SBA now has a rule that a mentor-protege relationship that is terminated within 18 months 
uh, will not be counted toward the two mentor lifetime limit. So a protege may have two mentors over the course of its lifetime. Um, if, as, as, as we probably heard, you're in a situation that you're in one of those situations where uh, it isn't working out with a mentor um, or vice versa, and either party terminates the relationship, which either party is allowed to do on 30 days notice, um, the SBA didn't want that sort of aborted mentor-protege relationship to count towards the, the, two, time, the two lifetime limit. So um, as long as the parties abandon their relationship within 18 months, it won't count towards the, the two mentor lifetime limit. Um, second, uh, the protege now may request that the SBA intervene if it feels that the mentor is underperforming under the agreement, um, which who knows, that may be constructed in some cases. Um, and then last, um, the SBA not only may terminate mentor-protege agreements if things aren't working out, but now the SBA has the option of replacing the mentor for the balance of the potential six-year term of the mentor-protege agreement. So again, protege has a limited number of these mentor-protege relationships that it is allowed to have over its life. Um, if things are not working out with a mentor, and if we're not within the first 18 months, then the SBA can substitute a new mentor to complete the six-year term of the mentor-protege agreement. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's an interesting, uh, interesting new change. It'll be curious to see if that actually happens. And, and it will be interesting to see if, if, if it encourages um, uh, proteges, in particular, to um, to pursue an early termination of their agreement if they feel like they're just not getting the bang for the buck that they were hoping for at the outset. We might see that in action. The um, rule changes to the joint venture program um, are as follows. First, uh, parties no longer need to get the SDA's approval of a joint venture agreement for an 8A procurement. So for years, our clients have been putting in their joint venture agreements into the SDA district offices and you know, working hard to make sure that they got the approval before the contract, before the contracting officer needed to make their contract award. Now, just like the all small mentor protege program, 8A companies don't need to get prior SBA approval for their joint venture agreements. They still need to follow all the rules and they're still subject to review by SBA, uh, but they don't need to get the prior approval anymore. So that's a, a probably a good elimination of a regulatory burden. Um, second, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, the SBA's view of things is that joint ventures are, are not supposed to exist in perpetuity. And for many years, uh, the SBA had the so-called three and two rule, which is that a, a joint venture could, could have or win no more than three contracts over a period of two years. And there were some exceptions to that, and it was amended over the years, and it was a little complicated. Um, but the SBA has now basically replaced that three and two rule. So you can just, we can all just forget about it with a much simpler rule that joint ventures may exist for two years. And during that two year period of time, they may win presumably as many contracts as they can. Um, there may be an outer limit to that, but you're no, they're, no longer, they're no longer constrained to only um, winning uh, the three contracts during that two year period of time. Um, third, the SBA has, has made a nice play to, to make uh, the world easier for joint ventures to win uh, contracts that uh, require the uh, facility clearance. <laughs> Historically, uh, joint ventures have struggled with RFP requirements that have required that the offeror possess a facility clearance. Well, unfortunately, these joint ventures are often only recently created, commonly just for the purpose, frankly, of, of bidding for the particular contract. And the joint venture is faced with the, the age old chicken and egg problem of not having a security clearance because the entity was just formed and it isn't performing any classified work. And there have been ways to kind of try to work around that, but it's been hard for joint ventures. Um, so the SBA has now, has now has a regulation that says that instead of the joint venture entity 
needing to hold the facility clearance, the individual partners um, can instead hold the security clearance. And there are some rules as to which partner needs to hold it, but um, it basically opens the door anyway, hopefully for, um, for allowing joint ventures to more smoothly compete for, for contracts that require facility clearances. Still some unanswered questions there, but, but a good step forward. Uh, and then last, a small technical change that's probably worth noting is that um, we're not going to use the word project manager anymore. Um, we're now going to use the word responsible manager. When we talk about that individual who is an employee of the protege is responsible for performance of the contract. So it seems to me of all of the changes, the, the facility clearance change is, is really the, the biggest um, potential change that I think is a, is a positive, because I know that has definitely been a challenge um, in the past in terms of joint ventures bidding on, on a number of contract opportunities that required clearances. I, I would say that that's right, Susan. Um, we, we still don't know exactly how, how DSCA is going to react to, um, to the SBA's rule. Mm -hmm. um, I think small businesses are certainly hopeful that, 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 that the agency will allow, the DSCA will allow um, the, uh, you know, one of the, you know, the, the relevant partner in the joint venture that would be gaining access to classified information to hold the clearance as opposed to the joint venture holding the clearance. Um, but I think that still remains to be seen. So uh, a few final thoughts on joint ventures. So, you know, joint ventures have the potential to be really good uh, vehicles for both mentors and protégés um, to expand their business base, to, to help them go after contracts they might not otherwise qualify. Um, but that doesn't always happen. And so it's important to think about um, when you are you know, too often uh, I see, and I work with a lot of small businesses that that enter into mentor-protege arrangements without really giving a lot of strategic thought to the the mentor company. Is it, you know, do they have uh, access to different past performance and things that are going to enhance? Really, what is the what is the the strategic drivers that are going to make the joint venture successful? And so I think. Those are all things that have to be decided up front. Um, the, the business uh, model, you know, John and I covered a number of areas in terms of the legal requirements. It's obviously really important to get a uh, joint venture agreement drafted, uh, your operating agreement, if it's a partnership um, that meets all the criteria. Um, but there's also needs to be really a willingness of both parties to be transparent. Um, part of the part of the problems that we see sometimes is when um, the joint venture members don't um, don't go in really looking at this as a true partnership where they they are sharing information and they are agreeing to be transparent. Um, Unfortunately, we've been involved recently in a, in a couple of situations we were brought in to look at the accounting records for a joint venture, uh, and it's happened twice recently for companies that the, the, the two joint venture parties got into a dispute, and it really was you know one not trusting the records of the other. And so there's a couple of things um, so we were brought in to, to go through the joint venture accounting books and records and provide a report to both parties. Um, you know, that should really never happen um, when you set up the joint venture. There should be an air of transparency, even though the small business partner does have those responsibilities for doing the financial reporting. Um, there should always be an opportunity for the other member to, to, to see the books and records. And some companies, some joint ventures actually do have a, a third party, have a CPA review the joint venture books to provide some um, assurance. Um, but we see companies sometimes just quickly jump in without really vetting the process, without really um, agreeing on the work share. Um, and so I think a, a, the goal for all, to, you know, for all is for the 
the joint venture to be a win-win. And as I think as John mentioned, some of these joint ventures can last a really long time. So if you think about, you know, particularly these IDIQ contracts that can, you know, last for, for years and years, and so that's a long time. Um, and so you want to make sure that going into the joint venture, each of the parties um, clearly is on the same page. You've agreed on, you know, how you're going to work together, who's going to provide what support, um, how the books and records are going to be kept. Um, you're going to think about um, your pricing strategies. Um, and um, and then again, I think being being transparent in in all of this. I think joint ventures are here to stay. Um, I think particularly with some of these rules, the the revisions with the SBA, I think we'll probably continue to see uh, to see more joint ventures. Uh, going after uh you know contract awards and uh so i think they can be successful vehicles successful programs one one handle handled right and so hopefully this uh webinar uh, provided a little bit more information um john any any final thoughts yeah i would just say that there's um Although there are a lot of regulations and the SBA is doing a nice job of, of, of refining them and improving them, there are still a lot of unanswered questions in the program. So, um, you know, it requires sort of a combination of, of expertise, uh, care, and, and good luck, I think, for these joint ventures to succeed. But clients are very interested in them. They are clearly win-wins. They uh, put small businesses in a place where they otherwise wouldn't be to win large contracts. Um, they certainly um, improve the chances of, of the mentors uh, being part of the small business program. Um, and things generally work fine for a while, but you do need to think down the road and make sure that your agreement is, is carefully thought out so that it doesn't create headaches and uh, that, you know, years down the road, you know, often during the closeout process when the parties are now have, they sort of have different interests and um, they start reading the contract to figure out what their rights and responsibilities are. So um, these are great vehicles and great ways to access markets that you otherwise wouldn't be able to access, but they, it just needs to be approached with care. Great. So thank you. Uh, so hopefully you all found this uh, helpful. Um, so both uh, Cherry Beckert on the accounting side and, and John with Pillsbury on the legal side, that's important to uh, obviously get the right legal advice and, and accounting advice on how to handle these and, and do them right. Um, we're both uh, would be happy to answer additional questions um, because I think part of what we see with a lot of these joint ventures is people have very specific questions. Um, if you do submit questions, um, and I do see a couple of them here that are uh, rather specific, um, we will follow up with you uh, and answer your questions. And if there are additional general questions that we see that we think would be a benefit to the to the group when the uh, slides are, are uh, sent out, uh, if there's some additional information that we think would be helpful, um, we will pass that along. Um, we want to thank you for participating. Uh, as we said, both of these, uh, the presentation will be available on our websites as uh, both of our websites put uh, have lots of other content on uh, information of interest to uh, to government contractors on a variety of topics and our contact information is here so uh, please feel free to each out to reach out to either one of us thank you very much